Uh, well, hallelujah. You dear people. Amen. Good to have y'all back. Amen. All right, take your Bibles. We're going to turn to Luke's gospel. Now, remember, we're going to look and find the devil. We're going to find out how to identify him here, and we're going to look where Jesus deals with the devil, and we're going to take that and see how we can identify him. Luke chapter 4, and we're going to look at, uh, again, remembering that we're wrestling with these principalities and powers. We're supposed to take hold of them, throw them down, hold them down. They're trying to take hold of us and throw us down, hold us down. Again, the idea here for a Christian is to render us ineffective to steal from us, to take our joy, take our peace, take the power away from our lives, to render us ineffective uh, in our Christian experience. And so the enemy does all these things that we listed, uh, torments, holds, binds, uh, uh, brings reproach, condemnation, uh, just all kinds of things that we read earlier, he does it. But if, I, if, if I'm gonna wrestle with him, I gotta be able to identify him because if I don't know where he's at and what he's up to, how am I gonna be able to take hold of him and throw him down and hold him down, okay? So let's see how this happens with Jesus. Here in Luke chapter four now, uh, before uh, we're gonna read, the, it's about the temptations of Christ, okay? And so there are three temptations. How many of you are familiar with that? Raise a hand or the temptations of Christ. Okay, I see most of you, all right? Uh, he gets tempted. Now the word tempt by definition means this. A pull, draw, tug, or enticement. If I'm tempted toward chocolate cake, I have a pull, draw, tug, or enticement to eat chocolate cake. I, I love it too. I have lost 40 pounds. Uh, unfortunately, I need to lose about 40 more. I hadn't had a dessert since Easter. I know it's bad. I don't need one till next Easter, but you know what I'm saying. I like dessert, okay? But I hate macaroni and cheese. You could put all the macaroni and cheese in front of me you wanted to, and I will have no pull, draw, tug, or enticement to eat one bite of it, okay? It's just noodles and cheese. And the brighter it gets, the more I hate it. At least if you burn the cheese a little bit, it looks a little bit like I might like it. But if it is, it, it, you know what I'm talking about, like Velveeta, they think that Velveeta stuff. I see the grandkids eat it by the bowl fulls. You just can't get them enough of it. And I'm sitting there, uh, but I'm not tempted. No pull, draw, tug, or enticement. Okay? Now, right here, this ought to help us a whole heap. Jesus was tempted. In other words, you can have a pull, draw, tug, or enticement to something that is evil and that not be sin. Somebody say amen. Now that's good right there. You know, because one of the greatest tricks of the enemy is to come along and tempt you in an area where you're weak. You feel the pull, draw, tug, or enticement to do it and right behind you tell you that if you're saved, that wouldn't happen. If you're really a God-fearing child of God, he'll tell you right behind that you'll have the guilt and the condemnation that comes from nothing more than a temptation. But the Bible says Jesus was tempted uh, uh, above every man. In other words, he had more temptations than any man. And here we have, in this particular passage, temptations that the devil gave Jesus. So in other words, there's a pull, draw, tug, or enticement, or it wouldn't be a temptation. For instance, if I told you I overcame the temptation to eat macaroni and cheese... You go, you didn't overcome none, boy. You don't even mock that. You didn't, you didn't have no pull, dog, tug, or enticement. Is that not right? So if the scripture says Jesus was tempted, he had to have a pull, dog, tug, or enticement to do this, or it wouldn't be a temptation. Okay? So the first temptation, he'd been without eating for 40 days. We, we can understand the devil said he's hungry. So the devil said, if you be the son of God, turn that stone to bread. And of course, Jesus responds, it is written, uh, man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. In other words, the devil's trying to get him to do something that the father did not want him to do. The last temptation, it says, that Satan took him to, a, uh, to the pinnacle of the temple in Jerusalem and told him to jump off because it is written, he shall give uh, his angels charge over that. And of course, again, he says, Jesus says to him, it's written, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. You know, a lot of people tempt God in a lot of ways in things like that. I had a buddy of ours one time. We was on the Bible college campus. Debbie and I were older than we went in our late 30s. And all the kids that were on the Bible college, 
uh, staying on the campus with us were 18, 19, the ages of our children, you know, 17, 18, 19, that kind of thing. And uh, one of them come up and said he was going skydiving that afternoon. And I said, I'm going to pray it gets canceled. And he goes, is that sin? I said, no, it's dangerous. <laughs> now, I'm not against you skydiving. I guess that's, you just got to do it. But, you know, uh, a few minutes later, he come back and said, the trip got canceled. I said, well, good. Praise God. You know, I didn't want you to go <laughs> skydiving. But anyhow, there, there, there are things that you ought not tempt God with. And a lot of people tempt God with stuff. Some of the teaching that you'll hear begins to tempt God in this uh, giving to get. A lot of it on TV is like tempting God, you know. I know people in absolute, I believe in giving. God's a giver and we ought to give, but we ought to give because God's a giver and we want to be like God. But the idea is not to get God. We ought to give because God's promised to take care of us, see. And we're trusting God so we give. We're not relying on that and so on and so forth. But this idea to give to get is like tempting God to do such and such and such, all right. So there's a lot of ways we might tempt God. But we're going to deal with this second temptation here because it gives us a, uh, some things that we're going to be using for a, a good portion of the, the rest of our time. Uh, the second temptation begins in verse 5, and we, it, it's on the screen for us. It says, And the devil, taking him up into a high mountain, showed unto him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time. Most of your translations have moment and time. Some have in an instant. How many have it in an instant? Got a few with instant, okay? Moment of time or an instant. The devil said unto him, listen to what the devil tells Jesus. All this power or authority a lot of your translations have, will I give you and the glory of them. He shows him the kingdoms of the world and he says, all this authority will I give you. For it's delivered unto me, Satan says, and to whomsoever I will give it. If you will worship me, all shall be thine. And Jesus answered and said, Get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. So let's get this picture here. It says, He takes him up to a high mountain, shows him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment of time, an instant, all right, and says to him, This is what the devil says to him, All these kingdoms will I give you, and the authority of them, because they've been given unto me, and to whomsoever I will give them, if you'll bow down and worship me, all shall be thine. And of course, Jesus said, it's written, you should worship the Lord thy God and him only shall there. Sir, a couple of things I want to talk about here first is this one. And this is extra. This is off the subject. But I tried to get out of it this morning, but God would not let me. He said, tell them anyhow. So there's something else that's going to go for this to come in, but I believe it's God. Have you ever thought about what got into the devil that he would think Jesus would be tempted to bow down and worship him? See, he's tempting him here. He, he has a pull, draw, tug, or enticement to bow down and worship. Well, that almost seems blaspheming, <laughs> you know, to say that about Jesus. But remember, temptation is not a sin. Just because you have a pull, draw, tug, or enticement, we know Jesus was without sin. Everybody say amen. You know, no sin. But it says he's tempted, and what he's tempted to do is bow down and worship him. How would Jesus have a pull, draw, tug, or enticement, and the devil be sharp enough to show it, to do it? Well, it's the same reason Jesus is in the Garden of Gethsemane. It's just hours before he's going to go to the cross. He prays three times what? Let this cup pass from me. What cup is he talking about? The cross. The awful event of the cross. Now, here's interesting. It's just hours before that, but our Bible tells us this, that he left heaven knowing he was the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. He had been visited on earth by the, uh, uh, Moses and, and Elijah telling him on the Mount of Transfiguration what was going to be taken. He knew it was the will of the Father for him to go there. Is he getting cold feet at the last few minutes and he's praying as it was, the Bible says, now you got to get me back right here, Debbie. As it were, great drops of blood pouring from his scalp. Now that's how the King James phrases that. Should listen to it again. He prayed earnestly, it says, as it were, great drops of blood pouring from his scalp. I said that and I heard some so-called medical folks and Bible so-called scholars, you have to watch them, say that it means as it were. It wasn't really. It was, he just prayed so earnestly it was like that. That's what, that's what I said. I mean, that's why I preached it. I said, as it were. See, that's what I said, as it were. Until. 
we were in a church in Concord, and uh, we had the motorhome was parked. We, we, we lived in a motorhome then all the time, but we got a little place now. We still have a motorhome. But anyhow, we had it to, parked in the parking lot of the church. And Debbie, something we ate, one of the restaurants, something, I don't know what it was, but she went to throwing up, and she spent 24 hours, I mean, throwing up. Couldn't go to church, no, no, just throwing up, throwing up. We had day service and night service. The next day, it got me. And when I got out of the morning service, I began to throw up. And I promise you, I threw up all afternoon. I called a preacher at about 6 o'clock, church starting at 7. I said, I ain't going to make it. I said, I ain't going to be able to make it. I said, I can't get out of the john. I said, I am just throwing up, throwing up, throwing up, throwing up. Debbie had it yesterday. I got it now. He goes, you're going to have to preach to the people. You're going to have to. And I said, brother, I can't even walk. I mean, you know, what do you want me to do? I'm throwing up. I, can't st I ain't got 20 minutes. I ain't throwing up. And, and it was one of them deals where you're throwing up and you ain't got nothing to throw up. How many of you ever been there? You just, you just, you know, it, it's just horrible. In fact, I just take dry. I, I just take stuff so I can throw up. I mean, so I'd have something because it was so gut wrenching. I just drink coke, and just you know, you know. And it, was, it was it was horrible. And so he said, "You just got to preach," and he wouldn't let me off of it. I said, "Well, all right, brother. Here's the deal. You get them singing. You get them singing. And when I walk in the door, stop the singing. I'll preach." When I finished preaching, you take over and I'm walking out the door. Literally, I was dressed and throwing up. Rinsed my mouth out, walked out the door of my Bible, walked in the back door of the church, sat down. They finished the last verse of that song. I got up and preached, left him with the altar situation, walked out the door, right into the motorhome, right back over the john. 2.30 in the morning, it finally quit. I got up about, I don't know, 10 the next morning or whatever it was and stumbled over out of the sink you know <laughs> looked up at the mirror and all of a sudden I thought what in the world is that all the way around my head like here it looked like I had on a mask was about an inch wide red band and I hollered at Debbie Debbie come in here come in look at my face look at my face and she got to looking at she looked you know She'd been a terrible poker player. But anyhow, you know, her eyes was like, oh, something's terribly wrong with you. But anyhow, she, she got to feeling around there and looking at it up real close. And this is what she said. Kenny, you have strained so hard, you have busted blood vessels all up under the skin, all around your face here. And that's what that is. And then it hit me. It wouldn't have been much longer of straining that it had broke the skin. And then it hit me of Jesus in the garden. Praying so hard, so gut-wrenching. Now, you know, so gut-wrenching, this prayer. I mean, can you, it's hard to imagine that. That it, phew, it came out. That next night in the service of that night, after I got up and saw that, I had everybody in the church come around and feel it and look at it right here. I said, come up here. I want you to feel this. I had to go through all this. I want you to see it and to think of it in terms of what the Lord. Well, what is he praying so hard to miss? Some have suggested that he's praying because he's going to be made sin the next day. Everything that the Father loathed. Well, he was going to be made sin, but he knew that already. That's not what he's praying to me. It's, it's, some have said, and erroneously so, that his body, he was afraid his body wasn't going to be able to go through all that was going to happen to him and he wouldn't be able to fulfill the mission. Listen, death couldn't get him. He was, if he's skinned, he was going all the way, okay, until he decided because he hadn't sinned. What was he praying to me? It was this. He had been one with the Father throughout all eternity. He knew the next afternoon when he was made sin for us, the Father was going to leave him. And his only desire, his only wish, and all uh, only thing that he really wanted to do was to remain one with him. He was breaking his heart to know that he was going to be separated, and he was asking the Father, is there any way we can accomplish this without me having to be separated from you? See, that's what hell is. We talk about it as fire and all, and it's fire, it's got that there. Don't, the Bible says so. 
But what hell really is, is a place without God. It's a separation for those that do not come by Jesus. They have to pay for their own penalty. But Jesus paid for my penalty. He paid for yours. We don't have to be separated because he was separated if we put our trust and faith in him. That's good preaching right there. Now, wait a minute. Okay, back over here. We're out in the wilderness now and Satan's tempting him and says, if you'll bow down, all this should be yours. It's been delivered unto me, Satan said, to whomsoever I will give it. If you'll bow down, I'll give it you. Do you know what Satan was doing? Why Jesus was tempted to bow down and do that? It was the very thing the Father had sent him to do, was to get the kingdoms of the world back. Now watch. And Satan was offering a way to do it without the separation. You don't have to be separated. I'll just give them to you if you'll bow down. And that's what he had to pull to because he never wanted to be separated from the Father. And so there was a pull to try to do it without the cross. But then he recognizes this is not the Father's will. The cross is the Father's will. And so he says, no, I'll not do that. Thou shalt worship the Lord thy God in him only shalt thou serve. But that's why he had a pull, draw, tug, or enticement to do it. And let me tell you something. Satan's still telling Christians they can have the kingdom without a cross. Jesus says, if any man come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. You can't have the kingdom without the cross. That's why, listen, I, I, I talked to some of you in the break, and, and, and I got to tell you, Joel Osteen would be great with me if he'd just call himself a Christian motivator. That's all right. But the idea that you're going to preach the gospel, that ain't happening, because he says... That gospel says God's up there to make your kingdom down here. That God's up there to bless everything you've got going on in your kingdom down here. And that's his goal. And he'll just bless you and bless you and bless you and, and fix everything down here for you. That is not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that our kingdom is to come. And So the, the idea becomes here that, that in this process here, that Satan's out here with Jesus. I'm on, but I ain't on, Amos. Oh, ho, 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 ho. I can't hold it that close, y'all. I won't be able to do that. Oh, he'll get it. He'll get it figured out in a minute. All right, we're back to the devil. Now, the devil's out there tempting. You got it now? No. Did I tear it, slap up? How to do? Hallelujah. <laughs> yeah, see, there it wasn't him. It was some up, something else. Wasn't the devil either. All right. But Satan still tries to offer us the kingdom without a cross. You and I are to trust God enough to believe he's got my back. He's taking care of me. And we don't have to live for the here and now. We got a kingdom to come. We got a God that'll meet our needs. But we get our lives so ordered up and frustrated and the enemy get us, gets us so uh, focused on temporal, natural, worldly pursuits and things that he gets us off track. Man, I'm headed to a city built by a king that's promised he's numbered the hairs over my head. He's going to take care of us. It's not that we got stuff. It's not to have little stuff. Don't, don't let the stuff get you. Amen? Because the enemy tries to get us all bound up in this temporal, natural world. Now, we're talking about seeing the devil. All right, here's, here's the greatest exercise God's ever given me to give a church in my life, okay? So I want you to do this. Everybody in here, Debbie, you've heard it before, but do it, okay? You're going to do it? Okay, here it is. Satan and the devil are out in the wilderness, all right? Right now, in your mind's eye, take a snapshot of it. 
Satan and Jesus is out there. Thank you very much. Uh, I love this. Help up here. Please help me. <laughs> uh, I need it. All right, now watch. Satan and Jesus out in the wilderness. I want you to take a snapshot in your mind. Do not fail to do it. Get the picture in your mind. You got that picture? He's out in the wilderness. Satan's tempting out the wilderness. Take a picture of it in your mind. Just a little still snapshot. Bam. A selfie. No, not a selfie. But you got my idea. Pow. Got it? Got it? Everybody got it? If you pictured anything but Jesus alone, you missed it. You don't know what the devil looks like. The devil doesn't have a body. He's a spirit. We got this idea of the devil coming with some pointed ears, a long tail, big sign says, I'm the devil. The devil's the spirit. Jesus is out in the wilderness. He's in a body. That's the whole point for Jesus coming. He was to have come through a virgin's womb to handle, a, uh, have a body to live here and have an earthly experience. It's going to come real important to you in a minute. And he's walking around in a body just like you and I, okay? And he's living here in this body. And so he's in a body, but Satan is a spirit. So how in the world did, did Jesus know it was the devil? Well, let me tell you something. The devil doesn't come with pointed ears and a pitchfork and a long tail. Do you know how he comes? He comes cloaked in a thought. In the pictures and images and imaginations and the thoughts of your mind. If you want to find the devil, you're going to have to find him in your mind and in your thinking. That's how he comes. Always cloaked in a thought. You're not going to see him. He's a spiritual being and he comes with the fiery darts and the flaming arrows of the thoughts of your mind. Now, I want to show you something here, and, and this is very important for you to see, and you can argue with me later, not out in front. I will tell you, I will rebuke you when you come, okay? So I'm just telling you right now, if you come with something opposite this, I'll be real kind and look at you and say, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus, okay? Because this is not discussion, this is teaching for you. Jesus, Satan, it says, takes him up to a high mountain. What's that new living say, woman? Remember Caleb? I just thought of Caleb right there. He heard me call Debbie woman. I told this at his home going service, but yeah, he, he'd slip up to her for years and just say, woman, <laughs> you know, kind of thing. But anyhow, come here and read it. Tell him what, what it says. Come over here and read it. Read to verse 5. This is the New Living Translation. I read. Then the devil took him up and revealed to Wait, him. Took him up. Is that all it says? Don't say mountain. Mm -mm. It took him up. Read on and revealed to him all the kingdoms of the world in a moment in time. In a moment of time. Is that it? That's verse read five. First, read five again. Then the devil took him up. Took him up where? It doesn't say. It doesn't say mountain? Mm -mm. Why? Do you know why? No. Okay, give me that. I'll back in. <laughs> <laughs> this is why. The devil didn't take Jesus physically up to a mountain. He couldn't do that. He didn't have the power to just jerk Jesus all over the planet. He couldn't take Jesus and just jerk him up the top of a mountain. Nor did he jerk him up the top of the temple in the natural physical realm. He couldn't, can you imagine the sight that would have been with Jesus and the devil who you didn't have a body up on top of the, uh, of the temple mount? I mean, that would have been, uh, you know, that would have been just foolishness to do that. And nor did Jesus follow him, you know, up there. That would have been sin to follow the devil. But let me tell you, make no mistake about it. He did take him to a high mountain. How did he do it? In the pictures and images of his mind. Watch this. Just like, lady, he can take you sitting in here and at home to that worst place when that man handled you wrong first. He can take you back to that picture and that image and how it felt, and he can begin to destroy you and wrap you up and take you in your mind. You can, how many of you have ever been sitting there riding in the car, and when you got there, you didn't know anything about the journey? Don't remember a thing. Now, where, where in the world were you? Because you weren't driving that car. Your mind was somewhere else, and I can tell you, you ever been in the shower and forget whether or not you washed your hair? <laughs> That's the slickest thing in the world when you do it the second time. You ever notice that? Man, you say, oh, yeah, I did that already, you know, kind of thing. <laughs> well, you know that so. Now, where were you? I mean, you know, your mind was somewhere else. And watch this. The enemy... This playground, the arena of where he attacks is in the mind. And if you're going to be able to identify him, you're going to have to identify him no matter what realm of your life he's attacking, he's doing it in your thinking. So he comes to take hold to you in an area of thinking and hold you down and pin you there. 
And He can torment you. He can begin to enslave you. He, but He does it in your thinking. If you're going to find Him, you'll find Him in your mind. And He's got an angle on us all. He knows where our weaknesses is. He, he knows. Listen, when I first come out of drugs and alcohol and all, and all the things, the addictions that, that, that God snatched me from, I can tell you He was constantly coming at my mind with behavior in regards to that. But those kind of things have changed. They're not, they're not that way anymore. In 23 years, he never deals with me with drugs and alcohol. Never. Some of you ain't with me yet, so I'm going to have to bring in. It doesn't matter what realm of life you're in. The enemy has an angle. Most of the time we think of temptation just coming to young people about sex and drugs and alcohol and partying. Now let me tell you something. The enemy has some kind of design as a roaring lion. Every phase of our life, every area of our life, he's looking. He's looking for a place to come with a thought, a picture, an image, an impression upon the mind, a suggestion to be able to get a hold to you and begin to hold you and grip you and bring pain and render you ineffective to hinder your marriage, your finances, your victory, your power, your glory, your anointing. He's looking to do it in your mind. Tell you about Miss Leah's. I love to tell this story. One of the most uh, things that impacted my life the most in my spiritual journey. Miss Liz was about 85 when I met her, 95 the last time I saw her. Every year, her pastor uh, would take me to see her. The first number of years, she was in her home, bedridden, but a steel trap for her mind. Love to talk to Miss Liz. Spiritual lady, love to talk to her. Last time I saw her, she's in a nursing home. She's in a nursing home. She's sitting in a wheelchair in the middle of the floor, 95 years of age when me and the pastor walk in. Just a little bitty room. Pastor sits down in a the chair. There's no place else for me to sit but then on the bed. And we begin to share some small talk. And after a little bit, I mean, she'd known me for the years. You know, through the years, she'd got to know me. And finally, she just looked over after, oh, five minutes of just, how's the weather? And, you know, how have you been? You know, this kind of thing. She looks at me and goes, Brother Kenny, the devil sure is tempting me a lot lately. And I guess by the way I look, she said, well, it ain't for a fella, you know, kind of thing. You know, I, I guess I look shocked that at 95, you'd get tempted, you know. So I said, well, all right, Miss Liz, if it ain't a fella, how's he tempting you? And this is what she told me. She said, he slips up to me and tells me, Liz, you've been a fool. You've given your whole life to a God that's not there. There's no real God. There's no God. If there was a God and he loved you and he was all powerful, Looks like he could let you die at home. You got your mind. There ain't no God. And ain't no God that loved you anyhow. You've been a fool. She says, you know what else he tells me? And I said, no, ma'am, Miss Liz, what else does he say? He says, well, if there was a God and he wouldn't let you die at home, at least he'd get your family to come see. Your family won't even come see. There ain't been one up here in months. You've been a fool, Liz. There ain't no God. And then she looked at me and said, you know what I tell that devil, Brother Kenny? I said, no, ma'am, what are you telling, Miss Leah? He said, I tell that devil, I, I remind him that while I'm dancing on streets of gold, he's going to be burning in hell. And on top of that, he said, he sent me up here to a new family, and I'm going to win everybody on this floor to Jesus. Now you get out of here and leave me back. But look at this. Here's a lady 95 years of age and the enemy's got an angle to try to get her to doubting, trying to steal her joy, trying to steal her peace, trying to get her to get angry with God and angry with her family. He's got an angle in all our lives. I can tell you, he comes and he comes cloaked in thought. And he's trying to render us ineffective. I can take you to a lady in Greensboro, North Carolina. Here's her story. Every time I've seen that lady in 20 plus years, she's told me this story or talked about this event. About 10 years before I met her, her husband left her for another woman in their church. Divorce, married this lady. Eventually after about three years or four, something like that before I met the whole scenario, that couple has a child. They come and repent before the whole church and tell them how wrong they were, how sorry they were that they had sinned and they shouldn't have done what they've done and the church forgives them over a period of time, embraces them, they come back in. We come into the scene right shortly thereafter 
And for the next 20 plus years, I can promise you, we've seen that couple that had that affair. That child now has children, okay, that was born to that relationship. Every time we've seen them, they have joy, they worship, they've gotten involved back into the church. But every time we see the little lady that suffered the pain and the difficulty, she reminds us of the problem, the hurt, how bad it was, how devastating it was. And her life has no joy. It has no power. She was the one done wrong. But the enemy has taken that and magnified it in her mind and holds her, rendered her impotent and begin to take the pain and hurt of something that happened in life and he has absolutely controlled her life, stole her joy, stole her peace and he's done it through the way she's thinking. He has an angle in our lives. He's constantly coming. Like I say, when I first started off, he, he, he would deal with me with regard to drugs and alcohol and things. But his life has went on now. He doesn't deal with me about those things. He has other areas to deal with me. See, he wasn't dealing with Miss Liz about getting angry at God when she was at home, when she was a young teenager. He had other things to deal with Miss Liz with about then. But I can tell you, every one of us in here, he's got an angle on. He's working because we're wrestling with him. We're to be wrestling with him. See, we want out of the battle. We want out of the fight. We don't like it. And we try to get God to get him off of us. And God has a plan for that devil in our lives. You're not going to get out of it this side of it. The enemy's coming and God has a plan for that in your life. Until you embrace that, he says, put on armor. Wrestle with that rascal. I have given you, in other words, we'll talk about this later, the authority to overcome him. I'm not, I, 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 I'm not going to get him out of your life. I got a, I got a plan. In fact, if I t really taught you the word of God, it'd be this way. God said, as a child of his, he said a, a hedge about you. He's got angels about you, and he's promised he's not going to let the devil come at you more than you're able to bear. Oh, come on, shout about that. That's good right there. I, I'm just telling you right now, he has already promised. I, he's on record to say, I got a hedge about you. I'm not going to let a temptation come on you, except I already know you're able to bear it, and I'll make a way to escape for you. You don't have, to, in other words, you can have victory in that. You don't have to go down to defeat to that. So anywhere the enemy's coming, he's already decided, I, I've got a purpose to let him pass that hedge. You're good preaching right here. And it'll change the perspective of where you see your battle, your fight, your war. Now, the devil changes his tactics. For instance, the devil used to torment me preaching. He tormented me. I know it was the devil for a lot of years. I, I, I'm going to tell you what it was like. When I started preaching as a young guy, uh, younger, I never was a young preacher, but younger. If I was preaching in a service and somebody slept, I woke them up. Now, that didn't mean I went and pinched them or nothing. But I'd preach loud enough, them suckers woke up. I mean, I'm just telling you, I'd get on top of their chair. I'd run the aisles, the pews, whatever it need to do. But you woke up when I was preaching. And so inevitably, every Sunday, I was seeing people asleep. I mean, just constantly. They'd be sleeping everywhere. And, and I, I'd wake them up. I'd, wake, I'd just holler and scream, holler and scream, jump and run. And, uh, and, and one day, the Lord told me, just whispered to me, said, Son, I wish you'd preach to them that are awake. He said, anytime they want to, the devil shows you them sleepers. You get taught about the sleepers and they got all them other people awake and you forget them and go to worrying about the sleeper. Get me mad, get me angry. I'd be saying things inside like this. I'd be preaching out saying words, but I'd be saying, God, why don't they sleep at home? What's wrong with them people? Why don't they come in here and sleep? You know, I, I, I mean, that's what I'd be saying inside, you know. And so then I'd be storming over there, you know, getting them. I remember one church I went into now. God hadn't told me this yet, but I knew this church and I knew seven preachers that had been in this church. And I didn't know them while they were in the church, but I knew they had pastored this particular church. And every one of those preachers had told me the same story about one fella in the church. He was a controlling boss kind of guy. And watch this. The first preacher, pastor, left in one of the drawers a letter of these seven I knew now. that They had more pastors, but of the seven I knew in a row, he left a letter that said, watch out for that guy in the drawer. The next pastor got that letter, and when he left the church, he signed his name to the original pastor's letter and left it in the drawer. <laughs> and all seven of them had read the letter and signed their name to it, okay? I'm holding revival. I know the man's name. I've talked to every one of those preachers about the guy, and I'm holding revival in the church. Now, mind you, God hadn't told me about the sleepers yet and to preach to those in the way, okay? So I'm up there preaching. He's on the back row reading a novel. 
Now, you know good and well, if I couldn't handle sleepers, I wasn't going to put up with no novel reading while I'm preaching. So he's on the back row, so I come down out of the pulpit, microphone all, right to the back row. He's sitting there reading the novel, and I promise you I'm standing this close to him, right over the top of him. He got the book. I can see the page. I could read it from right there. I'm that close. Microphone, as loud as I can talk. And he doesn't budge. He keeps reading. Ain't no way he's reading, but he, he keeps his head down. And I go on to where I think, he ain't going to look up. He, he ain't quitting. And I start walking back to the pulpit, and the Lord said, now what? What are we going to do now? Now watch this. What was I doing with the sleepers? What was I doing with him? I was trying to fight that in the natural realm. I was trying to do all I could do in the physical, natural realm. <laughs> And God reminds this is the enemy in your thinking. I don't care where you sleep now, you can read novels, whatever you want to do now. I got the victory over that. See, I do care, but I mean, you know what I'm saying. I'm going to try to wake you up. Some of you need some sleep. Go ahead, get it. I'll tell you something else happened to me one time. Before, I, I, it's a good thing I got the victory here. I was in a church. It's sort of a weird church. Everybody sat up front. You know, nobody sat in the back. And, uh, and, uh, the last 10 rows of the church were empty. There were nobody in them. And uh, I got up to preach, and all of a sudden, in come some teenagers. There was uh, two couples. It was about 19, 18, 19, something like that. They sit on the back row. Well, nobody in the church knows that they've come in. It's a big old church, long church, and 100 people or so, 150 up front, and them last 15 rows. So they just slipped in. And so I'm the only one who knows they're in here, but I'm up there preaching, and I'm going along there preaching, and all of a sudden, they begin to carry on like as at the drive-in. You know what I'm saying? They, get, they, they begin to lip lock and smooching and carry on. Both of them just locked in there. And I'm, I, I, Now, you know what would happen if I hadn't got the victory over them sleepers. What would have happened with this smooching going on? But I had gotten the victory over it by now. And so instead of getting mad with them, I started thinking, praying. You know, I, I, I'm preaching, but I start praying, oh, Lord, help them. You know, they think they, this ain't the place for that, Lord, but help them. You know, they're they, they in here at least. And, you know, but I'm preaching, telling all this. And I, every time I glance back there, boy, they'd be just rolled up in there, you know, just going on. And, and finally, after a, a little bit, I saw one of the girls sort of peeping, you know, out. And I just kept on preaching. Every once in a while, I'd see them. I'd pray for them. So, oh, Lord, help them, help them, help them. Next thing you know, I saw them quitting. And they quit all that smooching. And next thing you know, they was looking at me. And you know, when I gave the altar call, all four of them hit the altar down there. But what was happening? Enemy. Pew. 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 Where's the enemy attacking you? Because if you're going to overcome him and identify him, he's got an anger on every life right here. Every one of our lives, he's got a place and he's coming. I can tell you some of the things in Debbie's life and I'll just hit the high spots over the years. There are things that the enemy, we've seen victory come from. She used to have an awful fear of death. Terrible fear of death. Let me tell you how she got the fear of death. Even after she was saved, she had an awful fear of death because her daddy had an awful fear of death and explained that to her, spoke it out loud in her home. And so she come up with watching her daddy be afraid of death. You know why he got it? From his mama who was awful. So she saw them both, her grandmother and her daddy, expressing those things, talking about watching their fear as things would happen in their life about death. And so Debbie got it. Even after she was saved, she got it so bad, she had dreams reoccurring nightmares that she would see herself in a coffin. Walk over to the coffin in the, in the dream. I've held her many times waking up from that, okay, and seeing herself in the coffin. That fear was so bad in her life. In our hometown, she would drive miles. If she knew she was going by a cemetery, she'd drive miles out of the way so she wouldn't go by that cemetery. Got an eye and recognition that the enemy was tormenting her with that. And begin to do what the Bible says to get victory from that. And man, she don't have no fear of death. One of the things that was beautiful to me and just experienced it. Debbie had been an ob nurse most of her uh, life. But she avoided geriatrics. Why? Death. Close to death. But you know after got victory, the last number of years she got to nurse in a nursing home. And she'll tell you now, it was some of the most rewarding work that she ever had. As she would stand there by the death of a saint leaving this world without any fear of death had come take that life. What had happened, she'd learned that the enemy was there. And he was using that to torment her life. 
there was a, oh, what I was going to say, we were just in Pennsylvania in Bedford at, holding, uh, at a camp meeting, preaching in a camp meeting for 10 days, and we were 30 miles from, is it Shanksville? Flight 93 plummeted. And uh, we walked, went out there and walked around. Debbie could have never done that years ago without the victory that comes with recognizing the enemy, taking that fear and tormenting her mind. Some other things for her I've, I've noticed over the years, she used to be, she hates cold weather. But the enemy would use that and bring uh, depression with it. And when time change and it gets dark early, he would use that in her mind and pictures and images of her mind and bring those thoughts and begin to take her mood. In fact, she'd treat me differently based on it. Enemy. He's got an angle on us all. He's coming in our lives and he does it in our thinking. Can you identify the enemy where he's attacking you in your mind? Is it dreams? Is it uh, things that you're having about your past? He is a, he's a master bringing up the past. So what do we do? What do we do? What does the Bible tell us to do? What's the Bible? What's the main phrase? If you think of a main phrase that the Bible says what we're supposed to do to the devil. Anybody? What? Yes. 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 Notice the Bible says resist the devil and he'll what? Flee from me. If I resist the devil, he'll flee from me. Now watch this. You're not going to be able to kick the devil. You, ain't, you can't grit your teeth to get rid of the devil. You can't just suck it up and do better. Because if you suck it up and do better, it ain't you. It ain't uh, uh, it's you and your strength and your power doing it. It's your willpower doing it. If you just grit your teeth and do better. See, when I was an addict and, and was bound up by those addictions, uh, until Jesus set me free, I can promise you this. I had people even in the church tell me, just suck it up and do better, boy. Get tough. Quit that crap. I can't tell you a number of people told me to do that. Now, I understand what they're saying, and some people might have enough mm, saying, and be able to, but let me tell you something. If you'd walked where I walked, there might have been a time in my life uh, early on in my addictions that I could have sucked it up and done better, but by the time I, I'm at the place when I get saved, I was so far deep done in that, and the devil had such a hold on me, that it was impossible for me on my own to be able to suck it up and do better. And so they're trying to tell me to do something in my own strength when you can get to a place, if you go in something so long, you can't do it in your strength. You're going to have to have the power of God to get it because it's the enemy that you're trying to overcome. It's not something in the natural realm. If it was something in the natural realm, then you can grit your teeth and be able to overcome. But if it's the enemy, you're going to have to do things spiritually. You try to fight the enemy in your own strength, it'd be like taking a knife to a gun battle. Y'all ever see Indiana Jones? I believe it was the first one when that guy's out there doing all that stuff with that sword. Do you remember? Y'all remember that guy? How many of you got a picture in your mind of that guy out there with that sword? What does Indiana do? That's the end of that guy with that sword. I mean, he was doing all that stuff with that sword. He said, Psh! and he shot him, didn't he? Just Psh! And he put the gun up. Well, when you try to fight the devil in your own strength, it's like that. You got your sword. You just, and there you go. And he said, Psh! and that's the end of you kind of thing. See, so you're going to have to learn to resist the devil. There's ways to resist the devil. And I'm going to tell you, they ain't, there are a lot of, uh, we're going to lunch. Got three minutes. We're going to go for 45. <laughs> Get back in here, okay? Because I've got more to tell you. <laughs> then probably my hour and 15 minutes going to allow me, okay? So I'm, we're going to worship a little bit. Don't, don't cut your worship short, Stephen. Worship. And whatever time I got left, I'm going to tell you. Now, here it is. And I want you to be thinking about this in lunch. There are many ways this can be done, but there's only one real resisting of the devil. Okay? You can't kick him. You can't bite him. The scriptures only give us one way. And here it is. You got to speak to him. Everywhere in scripture that the devil is dealt with, with Jesus and people, he's always dealt with with the mouth. Jesus here in the wilderness quoted scripture to the enemy. Every time the enemy come, he said it is written. How many of you know Jesus could have zapped the devil? He could have sent him to Jupiter. 
Is that right? Get out of Go Jupiter. He'd had to go, okay? But he didn't do that. He, he quoted the scripture. He says, it is written. It is written. It is written. Why? Why did Jesus do that when he could have zapped him and sent him to Jupiter? Because me and you can't zap him and send him to Jupiter. But we can quote the scripture. He was giving us an example of what we're to do to run the enemy off. Now get this picture. He's out in the wilderness. He cannot see the enemy, but he recognizes the enemy in his thoughts. He identifies him. And instead of trying to fight him, he begins to quote the word to him. Now remember, he's out in the wilderness, ain't nothing out there. So he's speaking this out into something he cannot see, but by faith he recognizes it's the enemy. Can you see the enemy as he torments you, as he begins to bring these things that you have asked God to get off of you and keep off of you, and you begged and pleaded with him, and he's trying to get you to see, you have the power, you have the authority, take my word and speak it to it. One of the things that got Debbie out of the fear was speaking the word of God to it. For God had not given us a spirit of fear, but a power and of love and of a sound mind. Now she began to fight that spiritual thing, taking over her mind with a, a spiritual weapon, the word of God. And as she began to take the word of God against the spiritual enemy bringing that fear, it began to drive it out of her life. When she begged and pleaded and cried and prayed and all this, God's trying to grow us in these matters. Are you with me? And so the idea is when the enemy comes at you and tries to hold you down and bind you, bring pain, steal your joy, get you up on the mully grubs every day. Some of you get up like, mm -hmm. but God is great, ain't he, Scott? What did you preach last week? Something about being great. Somebody preached about being great. Who preached? About being great, didn't you? That impressed the people. They, they remembered it. They, better than great. They're telling me in the prayer room, they're better than great. That's good. Good preaching, brother. Now watch this. And we get up and the enemy starts telling you, oh, man, I look at you. Look what all you got to do today. You got to listen to me. Oh, man, I just feel like this, man. I feel like that. Oh, my goodness. What am I going to do? Ain't you here? Don't you hear him? Whoa, 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 no. I'm a child of a king. I'm better than great. I'm a child of a king. I'm bought by the blood of Jesus. Now watch what I'm doing. See what my mouth? See what I'm doing? I'm speaking what the word says and that comes against the enemy, begins to resist what? A thought in my head that the enemy's putting there. Oh, it's 12. I can tell this in a minute. I had a vision when I was a young Christian. This vision came to me when I was asking God and begging and pleading with God to get the temptations away and didn't understand why they were tormenting my mind and I'm begging God, I don't want to leave you, I don't want to go back, but the temptations to go back to the old way of life were strong. That's all I'd known. I'm 36 years of age, but all I'd known is sin. All I'd known is high, getting high, getting high. Put myself to bed uh, at night, uh, not counting sheep, but just thinking about the next high I could get into. It. Okay? And so now here I am saved and I don't want to go back and I'm having these temptations and I'm saying, God, what's going on? And God gave me a vision. Here's the vision. I saw this house. I didn't own a house, but I saw this house. It was my house. And there was devils up on top of the house. Looked like they was at the beach. Y'all ought to know about that. But anyhow, they were laid back. In other words, they were just sassy. And i never seen devils, okay? But that's the way they looked, okay? And I was coming out of the house, turning over a new leaf. I was going to do better, got me a job. I'm going to do this. I ain't going back to the drugs. I ain't doing all that anymore. I'm going to do right. Promise Debbie, promise everybody, I'm going to do right. And when I come out of the house to get in the car, drive off, one of the devils turned to the other one and said, get him. And one of them said, no, 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 no. It's too early. It's too early. Don't get him now. And so I watched myself in this vision go back and forth to work for weeks. And each day or every once in a while, one of the devils say, get him. And another one would say, no, it's too early. And after a couple of months, one day, of going back and forth to work, doing everything I said, all of a sudden just turned over a new leaf, feeling good. All of a sudden, one of the devils said, get him. And the other one said, yeah, it's time. And he flew off and perched right here. And as I'm riding to work, he begins to whisper to me, you deserve this. You can handle it now. You've been clean two months. It'll be all right now. You can go back. You deserve this. Nobody will know. You can slip down there. You can get high. You can handle this now. And he begins to tell me, and another one flew off and landed on this shoulder. And he began to preach. Yeah, it's okay. It'll be all right. Nobody will ever know. You can make it. And they start bringing pictures and images of getting high. And the next thing you know, I watch myself in the vision pull off the side of the road and begin to plot in my mind, and they begin to help me how I could do it. And I could say I was here, and I could say that. Nobody will ever know. And you know what happened? The next thing I know, I'm back down there at that place, getting high again, and the same vicious, crumbling cycle of failure started over in my life. 
I want you to picture that little enemy chirped up on the side of your shoulder, whispering that thing that holds you, the past, the memories, the fears, the depression, whatever it is that he's got a grip and hold of your life, and he just chirps and chirps and chirps. And there's only one way to get rid of him. You've got to speak to him. We're going to talk about how to do that, why that works in our last session. I'm going to pray for the food here. Father, thank you for the food. Thank you for the victory that's been given us in Jesus. Lord, bless the food, the fellowship, and our remaining time together today. We love you in Jesus' name. Amen, amen. God bless you, bless the food. Amen, amen, amen. See you in a little bit, 45 minutes. What is that? Put that on that clock. Yeah, I love that clock. Did y'all hear that?